does voting make people happy? And did the founders want us to starve? And both of these questions are based on questions from listeners to the My History Can Beat Up Your Politics podcast, though they are not certainly the exact questions that they asked. Carl Stowicki from Cleveland, Ohio writes, I would like to know what the founders meant by the word welfare at the time they wrote the Constitution. They included the word in the Constitution's preamble and in Article 1, Section 8, Clause 1. Today, welfare means redistributing wealth in the name of charity to everyone from the poor, all the way up to failed executives and corporations. The more liberal friends of mine claim the welfare clause gives the federal government a license to fund, therefore control, everything from an individual's personal health to many public endeavors that I feel should be reserved for communities and states. In other words, they think the welfare clause nullifies the Tenth Amendment. I love the podcast, and I know this represents a classic debate. It certainly does. Uh, Carl, it is the debate over the general welfare clause. And that is a key point, by the way. And I don't know if we're just skipping the word in the question or if your uh, friends are, are saying it that way, if they're calling it the welfare clause, when it's actually the general welfare clause. That's a, that's a key distinction. Sounds small. So you start with the preamble written by the Committee of Detail in the Constitutional Convention, most likely authored principally by uh, Governor Morris, one of the convention delegates who was had a good uh, hand in writing and was sort of the Thomas Jefferson of the Constitution. Maybe that's a stretch, but he wrote a lot of the, the passages, and he's credited with the We the People in order to form a more uh, in order to form a more perfect union, to establish justice, ensure domestic tranquility, provide for the common defense, promote the general welfare, and dot, dot, dot. That is a preamble. That is the essence. It's the reason why there is a constitution. So that helps your friends a bit in that one of the goals of the whole constitution is to promote the general welfare. Without it, don't need a constitution. Thank you very much. Then there's Section 8, which, among other things, authorizes the Congress to tax for the purpose of common defense and general welfare of the United States. Here's what we know from that. The founders, the members of the Constitutional Convention here called the founders, were very interested in allowing the federal government to provide for the general welfare. A lot of welfare going on in this document. The argument is over what that means. But we have the Tenth Amendment, which says, The powers not delegated to the United States by the Constitution, nor prohibited by it to the states, are reserved to the states respectively, or to the people. So, the Tenth is pretty strongly saying that if we don't give you the authority to do something in this Constitution, or do an amendment to the Constitution, Congress can't do it. It's for the states to do. But right off the bat, your friends are wrong on one point, if this is indeed your friend's point. Uh, the Tenth cannot be nullified by the General Welfare Clause. The Tenth is very much in effect. The only question is, in consideration of health care and welfare, does the statements about the General Welfare in the preamble and in Section 8 mean that providing for all of our welfare would be a power delegated to the United States government, the federal government, Congress. The origin of the language seems to be from John Dickinson of Delaware, who helped author the Articles of Confederation, a document that was in between the Declaration of Independence, the end of the Revolutionary War, and the Constitution, a document no one was quite happy with, didn't really seem to work. Uh, but it does contain this language uh, in its first draft. All charges of war and other expenses that shall be incurred for the common defense or the common welfare and allowed by the United States in Congress assembled shall be defrayed out of a common treasury. So when it's referenced in the Articles of Confederation and when it's referenced in the Constitution, general welfare or common welfare, always seems to relate to taxation. 
the Congress is allowed to tax people to spend for the general welfare. But wait a second, there's nothing in the Constitution or the first draft of the Articles of Confederation about spending that money. Congress can't spend for the general welfare, can they? Well, yes, it, the opinion of most constitutional scholars would be that where there's taxing, there's spending. The spending's implied. There's no reason to tax anyone but for a purpose. So it doesn't need to have in the document, Congress can spend the money that's implied. Otherwise, why are you taxing? You're taxing just to build up some kind of surplus fund for the future that will never be spent? Okay, so where are we now in terms of this question? We're nowhere. So let's attack again the point of what does common welfare or general welfare mean? And I got two points. And one is that wherever we see it in the Constitution and in that first draft of the Articles of Confederation, it's attached to common defense. It's common defense and common welfare. Could we imply that there's a connection? Is welfare just an extension of military-type emergencies? Perhaps that's a little conservative. After all, why would they come up with a separate term? Why then just not link it under defense if it's something like a charge that's needed to, say, build a wall around the city of Philadelphia because that's needed at a particular time for the common defense, that would probably be easy to just simply say common defense. So we're getting a little bit further here in resolving this question. I don't know if we'll ever resolve it, but getting a little closer. We can probably surmise that there is a concept of general welfare that the members of the Constitutional Convention meant that is different from just defense spending. So what is the general welfare, common welfare, etc.? Does it mean welfare, food stamps as we know it, welfare payments, aid to, to families with children, etc.? Does it mean national health care? Okay, I said I had two points. The second point, linguistically speaking, is the common defense and the general welfare. The two phrases uh, separated. So common defense we kind of know what that means, even though it's 2009 and we're talking about verbiage written in 1787. It would have to mean a pretty significant attack on the United States of America. It's hard to imagine if there's just some Indian attacks on the Pennsylvania border that the common defense clause would apply. Hard to imagine that. That's something for state militia units. That's a state or community matter. But if England attacks the United States, I mean, most likely they wouldn't concentrate on simply uh, one state. That's going to be a common defense matter. So affecting the entire country. It doesn't mean every part of the country at once, but a significant part. So we could probably apply the same thing to general welfare. It probably precludes or doesn't allow by the preamble or Section 8 for us to spend money on simply uh, the budget of Massachusetts so the state of Massachusetts can balance its budget. It would have to be something that would be needed for the entire United States of America or a significant portion. Did anybody talk about it at the time of the Constitutional Convention? Well, perhaps. Governor Morris, who had had a big role in writing the preamble, entered a debate during the convention about the issue of whether there should be a clause in the Constitution that allows the government to work on harbors and uh, do dock work, improve the ports of the United States of America. Morris said there was absolutely no reason to add language because the general welfare clause, not how it was called at the time, because the language about general welfare would already permit this. So there was no reason to add something specifically about constructing piers or navigating harbors. It is the same issue that would come up in early America as the federal government allocated money for roads westward. There were constitutional questions. Does the United States of America, does the Congress have the right to build roads? And in almost every case, the answer was yes. During the Monroe administration, when it was suggested that a constitutional amendment 
permitting the federal government to construct roads be added to the Constitution. It was waved off. There was no reason to do it. During the Jackson administration, when he vetoed a bill for a road in Kentucky, uh, citing a dangerous constitutional precedent, there was a revival of this issue. But even Andrew Jackson had no problem with the federal government spending on roads. In fact, his administration supported that. He did have an issue about the federal government spending on a road that would only link points within one state, the state of Kentucky. The fact that his rival Henry Clay was from Kentucky, of course, had absolutely nothing to do with his veto. But again, the issue was whether we could build a road within a state. Did that apply to the general welfare of the United States? So roads, canals, improving harbors... It was pretty well accepted in early America that we could do these kinds of things. This is a classic debate, no doubt, as you referenced. And as in so many questions, uh, two voices appear, and that is of Hamilton, Alexander Hamilton, and James Madison. Alexander Hamilton had a more liberal interpretation of the general welfare clause, that basically Congress could spend money to do anything, anything at all, as long as it affected everyone equally and wasn't aimed at any one particular state or small group of states. James Madison disagreed with that, and he argued that the Welfare Clause allowed Congress the ability to tax only for the powers that are enumerated in the Constitution. The Constitution does list specific powers for Congress, borrow money, regulate commerce, uh, make uniform rules of naturalization, coin money, punish people for counterfeiting, establish post office, promote the progress of science and the useful arts through copyrights, const uh, constitute tribunals when necessary, punish piracy, declare war, raise armies and navies, and call up the militia and organize that militia. Those are the limited enumerated powers of Congress. Building roads, building canals, making welfare payments, even fighting drug use, entering law enforcement, except for the law enforcement about the piracy, and etc. None of these are in there. Now you could use the Commerce Clause, the, the, the ability of Congress to regulate commerce for some of these things. Even health care has a role. If you're mandating something to employers, someone could say that's part of regulating commerce. Pretty extreme, though. But Over time, the Hamiltonian view has uh, prevailed. Uh, that's the easiest way to explain it. Strangely enough, it's folks like Henry Clay who favored westward expansion, who were more in favor of a kind of nationalist, national republican type plan and an American system uh, of building roads and canals that probably laid the precedent to pivot the general welfare clause and lead to the federal government involving itself in, in many, many things. Now, if your friends are looking for a legal argument, perhaps they'll have a point citing the general welfare clause. But politically, if they're looking for support of federal involvement in welfare and health care, they might be barking up the wrong part of the Constitution. They would be much better off, in my opinion, going with an unusual strategy, and that is citing an unspoken right to welfare or health care, uh, going with the, the Ninth Amendment, the magic or the unfinished Ninth, as I like to call it. The amendment that says the rights of the people are not limited to those in the document. What do they mean by that? Well, I think when a Bill of Rights was constructed, a key objection was the question of, why do you want a Bill of Rights? If you assert that there are a certain group of rights, will you be limiting the rights that you have to just those? Better choose carefully, because you get one chance. Unless you can go through a very exhaustive amendment procedure to add a new right to the Constitution. So the Ninth Amendment was a kind of way of selling the Bill of Rights just in the way the Bill of Rights 
was developed as a way of selling the Constitution. The first 10 amendments to the Constitution were intended to get state ratification conventions to buy into the Constitution. Well, there are opponents to adding that Bill of Rights, and the Ninth Amendment helped to convince those opponents. It took away that objection. It clearly states that the people of the United States have more rights than just those in the document. Strong words. Real strong words. Because a right, in legal terms, is a supersedence over others. So it's pretty high on the judicial priority scale. So in the ninth, buried in there, is that we have rights. We have, as people, things that can supersede the rest of the laws that Congress made. And they don't have to be listed in the Constitution. See, if you have a right to an attorney, that's just what you have. You have a pretty absolute right. If you have a right to free speech, you have a fairly absolute right. It's only other rights that can interrupt with your right. But what are these other magical rights that we have in the Ninth Amendment? No one has said. No one said during the convention. But there's at least this much of a clue. The founders knew that we had rights that the Congress or the President couldn't take away. And they didn't want you to have to go to that amendment procedure. The Ninth was very useful when the time came for a privacy case to be decided. But privacy had other precedents, not just the Ninth. Government can't force you to quarter soldiers in your home. You know, you have a right not to answer questions during interrogation. You have a right to to protecting from unreasonable search and seizure. Well, if you add these all together... As the Burger Court did, you have a right to privacy. Now take welfare. There it's harder. None of the other amendments directly support the right to, uh, of a citizen to welfare, nor is there a precedent in early America of the federal government uh, making payments to citizens. It's harder. I mean, many cities had poor people in 1789, and while churches individuals might help them, the federal government, and no state government would would take care of them directly. No other amendments apply to welfare. Now take health care. There's nothing there and many reasons for it. It didn't even exist to the extent that it does today. The Constitutional Convention was more concerned, it seems, with industry, sponsoring and fostering industry. That was a valid concern of the federal government. Regulation was guaranteed in the Constitution, and to support industry, Congress could issue copyrights. But they were less concerned with individual citizens' welfare or health. Why is that? Do the Founding Fathers want us to starve or to be sick? I don't think so. I do think the man of 1789 was not uncaring, but saw these as local concerns. I don't think there was any role for the federal government to play in distributing food or more medicine. It just would not have been possible in 1789 for the federal government created, such as it was, to enter those activities. They'd have no role to play. In 2009, it may be practical to no longer see it this way. You've got at least two valid reasons for the federal government to be involved in health care, not necessarily a Canada-type single-payer system, but be involved in health care. Volume purchasing and standardization of electronic medical records. A third might be the lack of health care in rural areas where the locality cannot afford it, where the distance is too great, And the only entity that could step in is a federal government. Now, as to your question, your friends argue that the welfare language in the Constitution enables Congress to look out for the welfare of its citizens. Not entirely sure. Not because the founders weren't caring, but because they probably assumed that states and localities would do this. And then we just get to a question of 1789 versus 2009. If you're talking about the health care of 1789, that was probably best left at a local level. Is modern health care best left that way? Tough question. A little bit more difficult. 
The argument your friend should be making is, why didn't copyrights become a local concern instead of a concern of the federal government? Since a technology existed to help foster the creative, uh, the creativity of industry in 1789, Congress jumped on it. No technology existed in the medical field. If you're talking about the welfare of 1789, welfare of citizens, probably best left to localities, families, communities, etc. Is that true today? In the, in the case of both healthcare and welfare, the means to do things have improved. Back to the 10th. The states didn't want the federal government involved in their local matters. The 11th was another shot against the bow, this time against the federal judiciary. So the 10th. Obviously, though, the federal government has grown, despite the 10th Amendment. And if you look at voting rights, for instance, it's been shown in history that states could not handle this, particularly, this particular right alone. So most civil rights have come through federal government intervention. Is health care or welfare a civil right? You come back to the ninth, or I believe you don't have a great constitutional case at all. Every other item, every other item, even voting matters, is an issue of legal rights. The right of the individual vis-a-vis the right of this federal government. Most of the amendments deal with legal rights. The Constitution is a document of legal rights, that, and the Bill of Rights is a document protecting you from the government that the Constitution creates. Outside of that protection from government, the Constitution doesn't do much. Not because it doesn't want to, not because the founders wanted you to starve and be sick, but because there were other mechanisms to handle it, state governments, for instance. And they believed state governments would. But they didn't confront the kind of costs for health care that states are confronting now. The founders didn't have any kind of vision to see that. What would they do if they thought that state and local systems were overloaded? So health care and welfare is a different issue. The right of an individual vis-a-vis surviving in the world. None of the other amendments address that. So to me, the best place for your friends to go for their argument is to the very beginning, the Declaration, Life, Liberty, Pursuit of Happiness, in establishing an unspoken Ninth Amendment right to life. So the founders wanted to starve? No. But I think the state legislators, they thought, could take care of us. One court case that has resolved this issue is South Dakota v. Dole, which has to do with highway funds. The federal government provides funds to states for highways, but requires that you have a drinking age of 21. States argued, we want the money, and we don't want to necessarily institute a drinking age of 21. We just want the money. It's supposed to be for highways. What does it have to do with the drinking age? And the Supreme Court ruled that it's the federal government's money, and if the states accept it, then they have to abide by the conditions. That's constitutional. This may be a way to handle. It is the way that welfare is handled, grants from the federal government uh, to state bodies. It's the way unemployment is handled. And it might be a model for health care. I know I haven't answered the question after all this discussion of whether the general welfare cause permits Congress to provide a national health care system, a uh, national welfare system. And I guess it's an unanswerable question in a sense. You could debate both points. There's strong ammunition for both points. But practically speaking, what's the best way to solve the problem? And that would be, I believe, the federal government provides money with whatever conditions and funnels it to the states to administer. And anyone arguing for a right to health care might have a difficult time with the general welfare clause. I suppose you could argue that if the entire United States is sick, then we won't be a strong country. But I think you have a problem with the general welfare clause. You probably want to go to the ninth and assert an unspoken right to be taken care of, to be healthy when one is sick. 
And then when presented with the argument that it's not written in the Constitution, you want to say, well, that's the reason there's a ninth. The people have more rights than what's in that document. And the founders didn't care to enumerate them. Does voting make us happy? It should, shouldn't it? After all, the guy or gal most of us people want in office is in office as the result of our democracy. Now, the people who didn't vote for the winner may not be happy. They wanted someone else, of course. But that's an easy question to resolve. We want the most people to be happy. And so the plurality are happy. And that's good. Of course, this still leads to a healthy chunk of unhappy voters. And three or four way elections could leave a majority of unhappy voters. It can lead to a situation where there's tremendous opposition to the office holder, but they still have enough to win the election. The system still worked, though. Given the divisions, it made the most people happy that it could. Timbabwe writes, Gaming the Vote by William Poundstone. I read this book last week and greatly enjoyed it. Lots of strategy, mathematical explanation of various voting methods without too many equations. He finds bush Perot clinton race more interesting than bush nader gore Basically, every voting system has strength and weaknesses. Unscrupulous consultants can exploit known tricks to nudge the vote towards a candidate. Much more subtle than Tammany Hall or Chicago ward healers, no ballot box stuffing or destroying votes. That's why Republican consultants collected signatures for Nader in 2008. Under the present system, the best strategy is for both parties to nominate a centrist and support Sub Rosa, a fringe candidate on the other side. So writes Tim Bobway. And the essence of the question is, does voting really make people happy? Are the winners happy? There lies the downfall of our voting system. It's subject to an awful lot of strategic voting where people are not picking the person they love. They're picking the person they like more than the other and they think will win. If majority voting was really the only method ever used for all elections, both primary, convention, and general, we wouldn't have seen several presidents that we did. Abraham Lincoln's presidency never would have happened. It would have been President William Seward. Woodrow Wilson would never become president. Not having been the original choice of Democrats gathering Baltimore in 1912. We would have seen a President Champ Clark, perhaps, or probably a third term for Theodore Roosevelt. Of course, we would not have had a President Harding, and thus not a President Coolidge, Likely in 1920, the man elected would have been a friend of Theodore Roosevelt's named Leonardo Wood. Martin Van Buren certainly would not have succeeded Jackson. And that's because Van Buren insisted on a non-majority procedure for the first Democratic convention ever. He wanted a procedure that would help protect, well, himself, that the winner had to win with a two-thirds majority, a supermajority. Well, maybe this is good in a democracy. The voters, in this case Democratic Convention voters, would have to be really happy to settle on a nominee. They'd have to really like that nominee. That two-thirds standard would never pass muster in an American election. Two-thirds would be impossibly high for any group of people as broad as the entire United States electorate. And it would take forever, as convention votes do, or did, back when they were real votes. The implication of party voting systems with a two-third lock is that the group, the Democrats for instance, should really be behind that candidate. These are the people that are, after all, going to be supporting that candidate in the general election. So we don't want any halfway people. We want that person to be their representative, hence the two-thirds vote. It's just a little easier when you've got everybody under a tent or in an arena for a few days to work out their happiness versus the whole nation. Many, many ballots. But why did Martin Van Buren have to mess with a perfectly good thing? What's wrong with a majority? Why go to another system? It seems so innocent. Majority wins, right? But consider this. If we voted today for which state to locate the capital of the United States in, it's likely that California would win. Some, a few Californians, might be thoughtful enough to think, well, let's give the capital to Kansas or Delaware. 
but then a few fluke votes from other states might give the capital to California as well. Canceling those fluke votes out. Geographic bias would rule. People would like the United States Capitol to be as close to them as possible. And California wins. Yet a swath of states is unhappy. The most people are happy, that could possibly be happy, but a large swath of the country is unhappy. As they might be now with the location of the capital, so far away from our western states. But it was not so far away from most at the time. Then it was winter, near as it was to the populous state of Virginia. Gaming the vote thinks something's very wrong with standard majority voting, as exercised and mandated by states in primary and general elections all over the country. And it's the ability of a minority candidate to sign up a nefarious challenger with some idea that they'll drain votes from the majority candidate in order for the minority candidate to win. It's known, for instance, that Republicans supported Nader. Even though Nader's positions are well far to the left of most Republicans. But their interest was in defeating Gore, 2000. Poundstone calls this trick the genetically engineered tomato of American politics. And he thinks it's really a problem and we have to do something to fix it. He cites uh, at least five American elections which didn't work out due to a, a, a... minority candidate, a vote-splitting put into office James Polk. Polk was a supporter of slavery, a slave owner himself, wanted slavery expanded west. His benefactors, not actually his home state of Tennessee, actually lost that state, but New Yorkers, especially the Liberty Party, an anti-slavery party, opposed in position very much with Polk and the Democratic Party. But they drained votes from the Whig candidate, Henry Clay, in New York. And New York went to Polk by a plurality. Now, this is a little unfair, as Henry Clay wasn't exactly an abolitionist either, and he sort of wiggled on the issue of slavery. But his politics were closer to Liberty Party voters. Closer, that's it. Closer didn't matter, apparently, to those Liberty Party voters in 1844. Nor did it matter to Nader voters in 2000. Closer didn't matter. They wanted to be happy. They wanted their vote to make them happy. They didn't want to vote for Al Gore just because he could win. We can be assured that most Nader voters in 2000 were aware of the strategic voting possibility that their vote might hurt Gore. It's all over the media. They still voted for Nader. Now, somewhere in states like New York or California where they knew They weren't going to hurt Gore. But how do we avoid this problem and get happier? Well, Poundstone talks about a variety of solutions. One that's advocated by third-party supporters is runoff voting. Now, you can do this in a couple ways. You can do an instant runoff or you can do a delayed runoff. Uh, What's very common out there is a delayed runoff. You vote for a guy, but if there's no majority, there is a runoff from the two highest vote-getters. So now there's no chance of a plurality win. A majority candidate's going to win. It might be a 50.5% majority, but gosh darn it, somebody's going to win. So you can vote for your dream candidate in the first election, but in the second runoff, you can get strategic. This uh, system probably would have helped Perot in 1992. It eliminates the I'm not voting for you because you can't win factor. It ensures that third-party candidates won't be deprived of oxygen so early that they can't develop. Nader voters could, in a runoff, choose Gore or then Bush. But it's expensive, requires a whole different runoff. It puts the election in a different date and time and makes it really a different election. Once you put even a month between two elections, there could be a different mood among voters. There could be different money poured into a particular state or city. There could be new endorsements, new events going on. It's not the same as having an election at one time time. So there's an artificialness to a real runoff. And it also has the nagging problem that while one can vote for the dream candidate in the first election, in the second runoff it's strategic voting just like in any majority election. But if we had it in 1844, Liberty Party voters would have voted for their candidate, others would have voted for Henry Clay, others would have voted for Polk. Polk wouldn't have gotten enough to beat a runoff. The runoff happened and presumably Henry Clay would have won that election and become president. 
You could also do what's called an instant runoff, meaning that when one goes to vote, they will vote for one candidate as first choice, another candidate as second choice, and perhaps in some systems, a candidate as a third choice. So if we're talking about the 1992 election, one could have made a vote for Perot and Clinton or a vote for Bush and Perot. In the 2000 election, you could have voted for Nader as your first choice and then Gore as your second. And what happens? Well, if there's no winner in the first election, we go to the second choice ballots and see who wins that election. And so if you have a candidate who's nobody's first choice but everybody's second, they could win in the instant runoff system. If you have a candidate that people like but are afraid to vote for, they would win in the instant runoff system. It's very popular in Australia. Uh, The Irish presidential election uses it. Some cities in the U.S. use it. It's been said that it can help third-party candidates. It's been said that it can help minority candidates. Instant runoff has not been used for any uh, presidential election in history, of course. It's difficult to tell what might happen if it was used in American presidential election. One thing, though, with the knowledge of history it's not difficult to uh, tell is that since runoffs uh, have been used or second ballots have been used in American political conventions, we do know what goes on there, and that is that it's very common for candidates to make deals with others to run for second place in the hopes that there will be no first round majority winner. So you'll actually have deals between candidates which are honored, uh, which is for the first ballot, you don't support yourself, you support me, and then in the second ballot, I support you if I don't win the first ballot. And so candidate A who wants to win the first ballot is taking the chance that he's going to win on the first, and candidate B's taking a chance that he won't win on the second. And usually in history, these deals were honored. Uh, Warren Harding in the 1920 convention was supporting uh, Governor Loudon over Leonardo w- Wood. And Harding's support helped Wood to lose that first uh, ballot. But several ballots down, Harding cashed in his chips and won the nomination of the Republican Party. Some claim that it reduced the negativity in elections because candidates are going for that second place vote if they don't get the first and they they have to be good. On that note, there is another system which would really produce, in my opinion, a group of angels running for whatever office you use this system for, and that is range voting. Here you would have a ballot with a group of candidates and numbers perhaps from 1 to 10 or 1 to 100, and you would rate for each candidate how much you like the candidate. The candidate who has the most points wins. So someone uh, might give, in the 2000 election, you know, Nader a 10, Gore a 5, and Bush a 1. So it's not just people pinning their hopes on one candidate and, and hoping uh, that candidate beats the other strategically. You can actually decide which candidate you're most happy with. And so in the 2000 election, instead of uh, Nader voters perhaps voting for Nader, but having some sympathy for Gore, just not caring enough to give up their all-important vote, their happiness, might have, under a range system, given Nader a 10, Gore an 8, Bush a a 1, and uh, possibly, probably, uh, Gore would have won that type of election. And that's a great election. It's a great method of election in this way, Giving points to one person doesn't necessarily hurt the other. It's not zero-sum. You can give Nader a 10, you can give Gore a 10. It's just that a lot of people have to like uh, the candidate. Now, it would encourage, we might think, uh, candidates to be on their best behavior. because Everybody wants a high rating. There are even more complicated systems. One of the voting systems... And intended to detect voters' happiness the most, and this is talked about in, in an article I read about this game in the vote book, is one designed by the Marquis de Condorcet in the 1700s. Condorcet voting 
involves a kind of instant pairwise runoff of the candidates once a range is established. It's not easy to describe in audio because it involves a table, but essentially you arrange the candidates downward on a, ba- on a ballot, and then, not unlike the instant running uh, runoff system, you rate your first choice, your second choice, your third choice, and your fourth choice, depending on how many uh, candidates there are. So let's take a 2000 election and say uh, Bush, Gore, Nader, and Buchanan, right? Each person would rank first, second, and third, fourth among all those. So someone who is uh, of a very liberal mindset, for instance, might have voted Nader, Gore, Bush, Buchanan. Somebody who is an extreme conservative might have voted Buchanan, Bush, Gore, Nader. And there could be combinations in between. Now, when those ballots are counted, and you can imagine counting, you know, 120 million of these, it's not enough just to total up the votes and say who was the first choice. And in this system, the Condorcet system, it's not even enough to just, if you don't have a majority in the first choices, go to the number two and say who won the number two. What you've got to do is you've got to count up all of the pairings. And so first, you know, you would start with Gore versus Bush and look at all of the votes and say who put Gore before Bush. So would Gore defeat Bush in that pairing? Then you've got to look at Gore versus Nader. In how many ballots was Gore ahead of Nader? Then you've got to look at Gore versus Buchanan. In how many ballots was Gore ahead of Buchanan? Then you've got to look at Bush versus Nader, Bush versus Buchanan, and Nader versus Buchanan. Uh, That ought to do it. The winner is the one who wins the most pairings. It's likely in the 2000 election that Gore would be the Condorcet winner because he would most likely win uh, most of those pairings, especially uh, those who did the the old Nader, Gore, Bush, Buchanan. Maybe that's assuming a lot. I have encountered people who did vote for Nader who actually... Their second choice was Bush. I think it's a little bit rare, and polling data would support that. What the Condorcet system completely eliminates is the spoiler effect. And so a a Buchanan voter, for instance, in a majority system like you had in the 2000 election, plurality system, is picking Buchanan over Bush. Just the same as they're picking Buchanan over Nader, just the same as they're picking Buchanan over Gore. A vote for Buchanan is a vote against Bush. That's simple. Just like in 1844, a vote for the Liberty Party was a vote against Henry Clay. The Condorcet system is much better at picking up nuances. Well, wait a second. I voted for Buchanan, but, you know, I certainly put Bush ahead of Gore. And it allows more happiness of the voters to be expressed. It's an extremely difficult system to administer. There is the chance of a tie in which things get weird. And there's some possible ways that it could be manipulated, though it's a little bit uh, uh, more difficult. So I'm thankful for the question, and I hope you enjoyed this look on does voting make us happy. And there are other ways to do this than a simple plurality vote. And it's certainly something worth uh, looking at. I want to thank you for listening. I know this was a long one and uh, some complicated topics, but I'm glad to have the opportunity to talk about it. The website is myhistorycanbeatupyourpolitics.com. The archive is there. We've got a book on the signers of the Declaration of Independence called They Signed. That is uh, $3.99, and it's available from the website.